First of all, I want to thank Preacher again for the opportunity to preach tonight, and I say this every time I get up to preach because I don't want uh, to ever take this for granted, but I don't take this lightly, the opportunity to stand behind this pulpit and have the opportunity to preach, and uh, what a privilege it is to, to do that, and what a privilege it is to work at a place like this, and I just appreciate all the pastor has uh, done for me and for my family. Uh, Brother Sanderson, thank you for that song. Every time I hear that song, it, it always touches my heart with uh, different things that we've been through, of course. And, you know, it's, I, I, I hear singers get up and sing these heart-wrenching songs, and I, I could never do that. I could never get up and sing a song like that and make it all the way through. I mean, I'd be crying through the starting at the first verse. And so, but anyway, it uh, comes from the heart. And thank you so much, Brother Sanderson. Appreciate that. Pastor Tebow texted me yesterday afternoon about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and he asked me if I wanted to preach and, uh, to this afternoon or this evening, and I first I checked the date made sure it wasn't April Fool's Day. And <laughs> sure he wasn't playing a joke on me. But it, uh, it was either, uh, but anyway, it wasn't. So um, I immediately I uh, went over and I got on my knees and I prayed and I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on tonight? And I like it when God does this. You know, within 10 seconds, God just put this thought in my head immediately and I just had this peace about what God wanted me to preach on tonight. And I want to talk tonight for a little bit about the power of unity. The power of unity. Look at Psalm 133 again. Look at verse number 1. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God desires unity for His people. Look at what God likens unity to. Look at verses 2 and 3 again. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. And that's talking about when Aaron was anointed to be priest. And that ointment was precious. That ointment had a sweet smell to it. Unity is precious. It's sweet. It has been said that unity is like the fragrance of a lovely rose. Unity is precious. Unity is powerful. Unity gives purpose. In the end of verse 3 it says, For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Uh, unity brings God's direction. And it brings God's blessing. God desires unity for His people. Can I tell you tonight, God wants us to have unity in our marriages. It's incredible what you can accomplish together in marriage. Two people united, working together, going in the same direction. Unity is powerful. Zig Ziglar talks about this when he talks about the old Belgian horse story. You know, uh, you know what a Belgian horse is. They're big uh, animals. They're powerful. And if you harness up a Belgian horse to uh, uh, something and, and have it to, to pull something, uh, uh, one Belgian horse by itself can pull 8,000 pounds all by itself. You take that same horse and harness it with another Belgian horse uh, who uh, has never been, they have never been trained together. And you would think that if one Belgian horse could pull 8,000 pounds by itself, you would think that two Belgian horses that have never been trained together could pull 16,000 pounds. But that's not the case. You put two Belgian horses together that have never met, and they can pull 24,000 pounds three times what one could pull. But then you take those two Belgian horses and you train them together for six weeks. And those same two Belgian horses, whom one could only pull 8,000 pounds, those two trained, pulling together, working together, can pull 32,000 pounds. Four times as much as one horse. Unity is powerful. God wants us to have unity in our marriages, but God wants us to have unity in our churches. Unity gives church power. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's amazing what a group of people united in spirit, following God's man as he follows God's plan, can accomplish together. 
You know, it was a group of unified people under the leadership of this man, Pastor Tebow, that brought our church out of the verge of bankruptcy about 30 years ago. Brother Ridings was there. Several of you were there at that time. It was a group of unified people under the leadership of this man, Pastor Tebow, that through the blessing and grace of God, established and grew Bayview Baptist Church to what it is today. It was a group of unified people under the leadership of this man, Pastor Tebow, that started Illinois Central Christian School. It was a group of unified people under the leadership of this man, Pastor Tebow, that expanded these buildings and renovated our auditorium into this beautiful place that you see today. God's power and hand of blessing has historically been upon this man and the group of unified people backing him. Unity gives a church power. It's amazing what God can do through a group of unified believers. Unified in spirit. Matthew 18, verse number 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. All of the great revivals in history, you look them up. I'm talking about the Moravian revival of 1727. I'm talking about the Great Awakening of 1735. I'm talking about the revival David Brainerd led among the American Indians in 1725. I'm talking about the revival in Wales, the Second Great Awakening in 1790, and the early American revivals of the 1800s. You look at every single great revival in history, and every one started with a prayer meeting. A group of God's people who came together in a unified spirit and humbled themselves and prayed for God to change their heart first. Because that's where revival starts. Revival doesn't start with the masses. Revival doesn't start with the lost. Revival starts inside the hearts of God's people one at a time. And then it spreads to the hearts of others. I'm saying there's great power in unity. But you know, the devil likes to cause divisions. The devil knows that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 11, verse number 17, Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. America experienced this with our own civil war in the 1800s. America became divided into two sections, the United States and the Confederate States. This division brought desolation to America over the course of four bloody years of combat, upwards to 750,000 soldiers and an innumerable number or an uncounted number of citizens lost their lives. Over 400,000 were wounded, and much of the southern infrastructure was destroyed. Now think about that. Over one million people either killed or wounded during the Civil War. America experienced this desolation, a house divided against itself, a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. You know, the devil is the author of confusion and division. The devil is the one that led an insurrection in heaven which resulted in himself and a third of the angels being cast out of heaven. And can I tell you, the devil would love for nothing more than to bring division to our homes and to our churches. God only knows how many good churches have been destroyed by divisions that came from within the church. It has been said that a church that loses its pastor for any reason besides God moving him on. I'm talking about for things even like morality, for doctrinal changes, or maybe people rising up against the pastor because they want things done differently. Listen, a church that loses its pastor for any reason besides God moving him on always loses. Check them out. They crumble. Doesn't matter what half or what section you're looking at. God only knows how many good churches have been destroyed by divisions from within the church. God only knows how many marriages have been destroyed by divisions. The Bible says that when two people come together in marriage, they are united. They become one. 
In Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus said, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It has been illustrated that when two people come together by marriage, that it's like two boards being glued together. And when you try to rip those boards apart, what happens? It splinters. There's damage done that can never be repaired. The devil would love for nothing more than to cause division in our relationships and destroy our marriages. The devil would love for nothing more than to cause division within our church. To divide the spirit of this congregation against each other and against the man that God put over us. Mark this down. A divided spirit is a destroyed spirit. A divided spirit is a destroyed spirit. As a church, we ought to be unified in spirit and unified in purpose. But you know, God doesn't just want unity. There are a lot of people out there in the world that are unified for the wrong reasons. God doesn't just want unity. God wants unity in the spirit of truth. God wants unity in the spirit of what's right. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Deuteronomy 32, 3-4 says, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. 1 Timothy 3, 14-15 says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Folks, we need to learn how to behave ourselves in the house of God and with the people of God. It says that thou madest, oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We need unity in our churches today. A unified spirit among God's people. A unified willingness to follow God's man. We need unity. But what prevents unity? I wrote down tonight three things that prevent unity. Unity. And I'm sure that you could come up with more than these three things. But I want to give you tonight these three things that the Lord laid upon my heart. First of all, I want you to understand that carnality prevents unity. Carnality prevents unity. When we're drawn away from our walk with God, when our heart is drawn away by the desires of our flesh, when our heart is drawn away from God by the influence of the world, when you feed the flesh, you divide yourself internally. When you fail to feed your spirit, your inner man, with the Word of God, you divide yourself. When you stop walking with God, you divide yourself. Matthew 6.24 says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John uh, chapter 2, verses 3-6, through 6, just a few verses earlier, says this, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, but keepeth not His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth His word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Listen to that phrase, the love of God perfected. Folks, that's what we need in our marriages. That's what we need in our churches. We need more of the love of God perfected in our hearts. Hereby know we that we are in Him. He that saith he abideth in Him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So how do you prevent carnality from dividing you and destroying you? 
Well, it's simple. Keep walking with God. Stay in God's Word daily. Pray daily. Stay faithful to church. Keep walking with God. Keep your sins confessed. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we prevent carnality from dividing us and destroying us by continuing to walk with God every day? Carnality prevents unity. What can happen in a marriage is one or both spouses stops walking with God and they begin to get carnal. They drop out of church. They stop reading their Bibles. They stop praying. And they begin to get carnal. Before they know it, there's division in their marriage. What can happen in a church is when you stop walking with God and your heart begins to get carnal, and then you start to negatively affect others in the church because you're not walking with God, because you don't have the right spirit. The solution? Keep your heart right. Keep walking with God. So carnality prevents unity. Number two, discontentment prevents unity. Discontentment prevents unity. When I talk about discontentment, we're talking about lack of faith. Division is what destroyed the Israelites time and time again. What prevented the Israelites from entering into the promised land? Division. Discontentment. That's what discontentment really is, isn't it? It's, it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith in God, in God's plan. So what prevented the Israelites from entering the promised land? Division. Discontentment. A lack of faith in God's plan. A lack of faith in God's man. Turn to Numbers chapter 14 this evening. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. This won't be a long message tonight, but I pray that God will use it. Coming up to the story in Numbers chapter 14, before we read there, let me give you a little background to where we're at. God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, of course, he did those, uh, brought those 12 plagues upon, upon Egypt and brought them out by a mighty hand. And uh, all through uh, Exodus and Leviticus, God, uh, and even the beginning of Numbers, God had been giving the Israelites instructions uh, on how to uh, build the tabernacle and and uh, the different parts of the tabernacle, and he gave them instructions on how to live and how to act and uh, how to direct their lives. And now we come to Numbers chapter 14, and God was getting ready to bring the Israelites into the promised land. Of course, we understand in the Bible the promised land is not a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of the perfect will of God. And uh, God was about to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. What did they do? They sent out 12 spies into the promised land to scope out the land. And you understand the story. Ten of them came back and, and uh, they talked about how uh, incredible the land was. They talked about the grapes. They had that, that uh, strand of grapes, that cluster of grapes that they cut off. And literally two men had to carry it between their shoulders. And, and it was incredible. And no doubt as they carried that thing into the camp, uh, the, the eyes of the people got big and they talked about how the land flowed with milk and honey. But then they started talking about the giants. And they started to talk about how the land, uh, how they were like grasshoppers in the eyes of the inhabitants and about how that land devours the inhabitants. And they began to talk about how uh, fearful that land was and they brought a bad report. Ten of those spies did and what did they do? They caused division. And the children of Israel began to get distraught. and They began to get upset. And look at Numbers chapter 14 and verse number 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, their leaders. 
And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. What was the problem here? Was Moses doing something wrong? You see, Moses was just following God's orders, was he not? Moses was ready. He was ready to lead uh, the children of Israel into God's perfect will, the promised land. But their problem was they got all worked up and they didn't want to follow the leader. They were discontent with the plan and they were discontent with God's man. But this discontentment, mark it down, this discontentment did not just show up in their hearts the day those spies came back into the camp. Oh no. This discontentment had been building up and breeding in their hearts over the last several months. You see, in Exodus chapter 16, you don't have to turn there, but in verses 2 and 3, the Bible talks about how the children of Israel complained of hunger. It says, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. Here they are, complaining again. Murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died in the, uh, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Doesn't that sound familiar, what we just read? In Numbers chapter 14, this is all the way back in Exodus chapter 16. This is when they had just left Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And they complained of hunger. In Exodus chapter 17, we read that they complained of thirst. It says in verses 1 and 2, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin that's a pretty fitting name for that wilderness, the wilderness of sin, after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses. There they go complaining again. And said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? They complained of hunger. They complained of thirst. And then in Exodus chapter 32, they forsook God at Mount Sinai. The Bible says in verse 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down uh, off the mount, uh, this is when God, uh, Moses went up to talk with God on the top of Mount Sinai. And it says, When they saw that Moses delayed to come down off the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we not, what not what was become of him. What happened? Discontentment. They became discontent. They became impatient. They didn't want to wait. They didn't want to follow the plan. Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1. The Bible says they complained. Now this is interesting. In Numbers chapter 11, verse number 1, the Bible doesn't even tell us what they complained about. Listen to this verse. It says, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. You know what complainers do? They complain. You find yourself complaining a lot? Do you find yourself having a bad attitude a lot? You better watch yourself. Your attitude is contagious. And you're probably causing division among God's people. They complained. And then in Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, they complained about the manna. The Bible says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And it's funny how they remembered all these wonderful things. And they didn't remember all those bricks that Pharaoh made them make. And they didn't remember all that hard labor and all the times they got beat. They didn't remember all that. They remembered all this good food. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. You can just hear them crying as they're saying this. 
Folks, they complained of hunger in Exodus 16. They complained of thirst in Exodus chapter 17. They forsook Mount God at Mount Sinai in Exodus 32. They complained in Numbers 11, uh, verse 1. They complained about the man in Numbers 11, 4 through 6. In Numbers chapter 12, verse number 1, we see that even Miriam and Aaron, Moses' own brother and sister, complained about him. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he married an Ethiopian woman. Now, did they have a legitimate beef with him? Did they? I don't know. Was this someone he was not supposed to marry? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But what I do know is God didn't like their attitude. You see... What's happen what happened here is in this progression of negativity among God's people, what happened here is that negative attitude began to rub off on the staff, Miriam and Aaron. And negativity, folks, is contagious. You know what happens a lot of time in churches? People come to the same church for many years. And after a while hearing the preacher over and over and over again, the sheep start getting used to the shepherd's voice. They get used to the voice. They don't hear the same things that they used to hear, the same warnings. They don't get the same conviction. They start getting discontented. Do you see a pattern here with the Israelites? Complain, 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 negative, 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 discontentment, discontentment, division, division. Folks, even though God had already told them it was all going to work out, you do understand that the children of Israel weren't going into this deal blind, right? I mean, they had watched God bring them out of Egypt. They had watched God divide the Red Sea. They, with their own two feet, had walked across the dry ground. They weren't going into this deal blind. And even if that wasn't enough, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 24, it outright says, God outright told them. He said, but I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. Now, I don't care if there was giants in the land or not. If God said, you're going to inherit the land, guess what was going to happen? They were going to inherit the land. He said, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess it. A land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Folks, God gave them His own personal guarantee that everything was going to work out all right. Guess what? God has a plan. You understand that? God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your marriage. God has a plan for this church. You know, God already knows how it's all going to work out. But the Israelites' continual discontentment bred division. And they lost their faith in God's plan. And they lost their faith in God's man. You see, once you have a problem with the leader, once you have a problem with God's man, you will find it easier and easier to criticize him. It's like this. Somebody said, once you make up your mind that there's something you don't like about someone, there's nothing they can do right. That's the truth. This can happen in your marriage. Don't let yourself get discontent in your marriage. Don't let your mind dwell on all the things that you don't like about your spouse. Do you know what God's plan for your marriage is? I'm talking about God's plan. Stay together. That's God's plan. This can happen in our church. We start getting upset about the way things are done and, or decisions that are made and we start getting upset about the direction God is leading our pastor and we get discontent. And the next thing we know, there's division in God's house and among God's people. Discontentment prevents unity. We're talking about the power of unity tonight. Behold how good, or be, uh, and behold how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Discontentment prevents unity. Number three tonight.
Pride prevents unity. Pride prevents unity. I'm talking about pride. I'm talking about self-focus. I'm talking about letting your feelings determine your direction. That's dangerous. When you start to get your eyes off of God, and you start to get your eyes off of God's work, and you start to get your eyes on yourself and your feelings, that's pride. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse number 10, only by pride cometh contention. Did you hear that? Only by pride cometh contention. It doesn't qualify that. It doesn't put qualifier on that. You say, but I'm right. Of course you are. Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Your pride gets you all worked up. Because everything becomes about you and how you feel. And what happens? A lack of trust begins to develop. Turn to Joshua chapter 22. I want to illustrate this for you. One of my favorite illustrations in the Word of God. Every time I come across this passage of Scripture in my Bible reading, it tickles me when I read this. I love this illustration. In Joshua chapter 22, this is an incredible illustration about pride and how it develops into a lack of trust. In Joshua chapter 22, we have a story here about the children of Israel that had just entered into the promised land. Now, they had just conquered their enemies. They had just made it into the promised land, and they were about to get their inheritances. Joshua was about to divide up the land among them. But a while before that, as the children of Israel came to the river Jordan, just before they crossed over the River Jordan to go and enter in and conquer the Promised Land. Moses was still alive. He was just about to pass off the scene. And uh, three of the tribes, or two and a half of the tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, when they were on this side of Jordan, before they crossed over to the Promised Land, they looked around and they saw some land that they liked. And so they went, to Josh, or they went to Moses and they said, Moses, we would like to have this land here on this side of Jordan for our inheritance. It suits us well. It, it'd be a great place for our families to live and for us to raise our cattle and our animals. And he asked Moses if they could inherit this portion of land as opposed to what was on the other side of the Jordan River. Well, at first Moses got kind of upset about this. Moses' mind goes back to the spies, the ten negative spies, and how they bred division among the Israelites. And he got kind of upset because he thought, well, what are the rest of the Israelites going to think if you guys stay back here and they go over Jordan to fight in the battles? And he said, uh, he began to chide them, and he said, you're going to discourage the children of Israel when they see you stay back here all comfy cozy in your land and they go fight their battles and you're going to dishearten them. You're going to discourage them. And they said... Well, Moses, let's make a deal with you. They said, what we'd like to do is we'd like to build some cities for our wives and our children and leave them back here, and we'll take all of our men of war, and we'll cross over the Jordan River with you. And we'll go in, and we'll fight the battles, brothers and brothers. We'll fight with our, the rest of the Israelites, all the men of war, until, you have, until we have conquered the promised land. And then we'll come back and join our wives and our children. Moses said, you know what, that sounds pretty good. I'm going to let you do that. So that's exactly what they did. The, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they left their wives and children behind. They crossed the Jordan River with Joshua, and they fought with their brothers in the Promised Land. Now understand what's happening here. They are fighting in battle together unified. 
They're spilling the same blood and the same mud, even though the, the Gadites and the Reubenites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they know that they're not going to inherit this land, but, man, you can just picture this great unity as they're fighting together. God's hand of blessing is on those armies, and they're fighting side by side and conquering the promised land. Well, they finish the job. Now it was their time to go back and cross the Jordan River and go back and be with their families. Let's pick up the story right here in verse number 9. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 22, verse number 9, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Silo, which is in, Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan to go unto the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses, just like we just said. Look at verse number 10. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see. Let me explain to you what's going on here. They're leaving their brothers the Israelites, that they had just fought with and died with and shed blood with. They left them, and they got to the other side of Jordan, and the thought entered their mind. We have this Jordan River that's dividing these two groups of people. We're, we're all brothers. We're all Israelites. But what's going to happen when our generation dies off and their generation dies off, and their children see us over here on this side of the Jordan River their children are going to discourage our children. They're going to tell us that we are not really part of the tribes of Israel. We're not, we don't really have inheritance with the Lord. That God put this river between us. And they said, what can we do to prevent that from happening? We need some sort of memorial. We need something to remind our children for generations and generations to come that we're on the same side, that we're still the Lord's people. They said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build this altar this giant altar, not just a small altar, an exact replica of the altar that they sacrificed on before the tabernacle. They were going to build this giant altar that could be seen from all the way across the Jordan River, and we're going to build it as a memorial so that one day uh, when we pass off the scene and our children and, and, and uh, are asked and questioned by the children uh, of the rest of the tribes on the other side of Jordan, uh, who we are, we can say, hey, look at this altar. Uh, this is a memorial uh, of the altar uh, of God, and, and we're on the same side. It was a memorial. Look what happened. Verse number 11. And the children of Israel heard say, this is, now this is the children of Israel on the other side. This is the rest of the tribes on the other side of the Jordan River. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan in the passage of the children of Israel. Now they could see this altar from a long ways off. They saw it going up. Look at verse 12. And when the, whole, and when the, children, of the and when children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. Now think about this. The rest of the tribes of Israel are on, now don't read ahead on me now. The rest of the tribes of Israel are on the other side of the Jordan River. And they're looking at this altar that's being that's, that's going up. And all of a sudden, somebody said, who knows who it was? I don't want to guess. I'm sure it wasn't a woman. <laughs> I am totally joking. <laughs> somebody said, I don't know who it was. Somebody said, you know what the Israelites are doing? The tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh, you know what they're doing over there? They are building a false idol. They are building a false altar. They have just crossed back over the Jordan River and their hearts are already turned against God. Now you know what the logical thing would have been for them to do? Hey, just send someone over there and go ask them. Right? I mean, come on. They had just fought together. They had just fought the same battles and shed the same blood and they were just unified 
fighting in the promised land. They had barely gotten across the Jordan River. And all of the sudden, they're not giving them the benefit of the doubt. The Bible says right there, we just read it in verse number 12, the children of Israel gathered themselves together to go up to war against them. They got themselves all worked up. They got all their tribes together. They said, man, get your swords back out. We're not done fighting yet. Get your spears back out. We got to go back to war. Man, they get all their troops rallied, and you can just see how angry they are, and you can see how upset they are. And this wasn't just a handful of people. This was a bunch of people, and they gathered all those tribes of Israel, got all worked up, and they got ready to go across the Jordan River to fight their brothers. Look at verse number 13. Verse 13, the Bible says, And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, into the children of Gad, into the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten princes of each house of a, a prince throughout the tribe of Israel. Well, now they send somebody after they got all worked up. Now keep in mind, their, their swords are drawn. They're ready to go. They're gathered together in battle. And can I tell you, these people weren't going over there to negotiate. You're going to see that in just a little bit. They were going over to tell them what, it, what, what, was, what was about to happen. And each one was in head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. Verse number 15. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them, saying, you know what they said? They said, we know what you're up to. And, and, and uh, the children of Reuben and Gad and half-tribe of Manasseh, they said, and they said, no, don't, don't you talk. We know what you're up to. You don't have to say a word. We know what's going on here. Look at what they said. I mean, they didn't, their first sentence was, can you explain this to us? Oh, no. Look at verse number 16. Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel? to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that ye have builded you an altar that ye, made, uh, that ye might rebel against the day of the Lord. Uh, against the Lord. Man, they said, you're, you're, you're rebelling. And, and the, the two and a half tribes, they said, ah, and they said, no, no, no. We know what's going on. Don't you talk. Let me finish. Verse number 17. Is the iniquity of pure too little for us? from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord. And you could see those two and a half tribes, they go, ah, and they said, no, 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 we're not done yet. Verse number 18. But that ye may turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. And they said, ah, and they said oh, we're not done yet. Verse number 19, notwithstanding, if the Lord, uh, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, because we know you're rebelling against the Lord, nor rebel against us, because we know you're rebelling against us. And in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God, verse number 20, did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. I'm getting kind of tired of listening to them talk. They're going on and on and on and on and on. Not once did they say, hey, can you just kind of explain to us? I'm sure there's nothing to this. Now I understand they didn't really want to go to battle and to destroy them. But the point is, they got all worked up. Now, wouldn't it have been much better if they had just given them the benefit of the doubt? Now, let's hear, finally, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh get a chance to speak for themselves. Look at verse number 21. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God of hosts, he knoweth. And Israel, he shall know if it be in rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. In other words, if we're really guilty, we deserve to die. Verse 23, that if we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. 
And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, and uh, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord, so shall your children make uh, our children cease from fearing. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it, may, that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that ye might do the service of the Lord before uh, him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices, with our peace offerings, that your children may not come uh, to say to our children, ye have no part in the Lord. I won't read the rest of it there. Could you see the look on those on their faces? Phineas and those ten elders from the tribes. Can you just see the look on their faces? They're all red. Man, they just got done chewing them out. They just got done telling them what was going on, and they're all mad and angry, and all of a sudden they're explaining this, and you can just kind of see their countenance. You can kind of see the red color go away from their face. That anger kind of turns into like a stare, blank stare. You can kind of see their tail kind of going down between their legs, sheepishly. And you know, what's funny about this story is it's almost like when the children of Israel, when, when, when Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, when they got done telling them what really happened, it's almost like those ten tribes, those ten guys, they said, uh, oh, Okay. And they turned around and they went back over to the other side of the Jordan River. Look at verse number 32. Verse number 32, And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest and the princes returned from the children of Reuben and from the children uh, of Gad out of the land of Gilead unto the land of Canaan to the children of Israel and brought them word again. And the thing pleased the children of Israel and the children of Israel blessed God and did not intend to go up against them to battle and destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. This is the part that tickles me. Verse 34. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar. What? What's the name of that altar? Ed. I just think that's funny. <laughs> Call the name of the altar Ed. <laughs> Folks, the next time you get all worked up about something, because you know what all the facts are, the next time you get all worked up about somebody because of some motive that you're certain that person had, you ever said this? I know what they were thinking. I know what they did. Has that ever happened to you? You start getting all worked up about something that you think you know, but the truth is you don't really have all the facts. And guess what's happening? The devil is causing divisions. He's playing with your pride. The next time that happens to you, Remember, Ed. <laughs> Remember that altar. And understand this. We have a big God. He's more than capable of taking care of whatever injustice has happened if, in fact, an injustice has happened. Folks, it can happen in our marriages and it can happen in our churches. Pride. Pride can keep creep in and cause divisions and destroy the unity that God desires for us to have in our marriages and in our church. Don't let the devil divide you. And don't let the devil destroy you because of carnality, because of discontentment, or because of pride. Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this evening? Tonight, the music is going to play, and we're going to have an old fashioned altar call tonight. We do every night, we open up the altar every, every night after the service, every morning at, that we have a service, we open up the altar. And I want to make a call tonight. I want to make a call to you for unity. I want to make a call tonight for unity in our marriages. For unity in our churches. Folks, the devil would love for nothing more than to destroy your marriage and then 
I love nothing more than to destroy this church through carnality, through discontentment, through pride. Listen, this message has hit home in the heart of everybody here. I know it has. You know how I know that? Because there isn't a married person in here who hasn't struggled at one point in time with unity in their marriage. That's just what happens. There isn't a person in here who hasn't at one point in time experienced some sort of division with a brother or sister in Christ. Not one. Why? Because we're flesh. It's our part of our human nature. It's part of our sin nature. Folks, if the Lord spoke to your heart tonight, would you take some time and come to the altar and get it right? Don't let the devil divide you. Don't let the devil destroy you because of carnality or because of discontentment or because of pride. Would everybody stand? As the music is played, uh, the music plays, the altar is open. <laughs>